1868, the zoo was founded with two pairs of swans. And now, 150 years later, we are this incredible center of science, of conservation, of great learning opportunities, and of uh, world-class animal care and welfare, and free and open to everyone across Chicago. It's just a very exciting time for us. When zoos were first coming to prominence here in the late 1800s in the United States and, and in Europe, they served a really important function of getting the general public a perspective on the diversity of life. They could see a real giraffe, they could see a real lion. And many zoologists and young conservation biologists were influenced by seeing those live animals behaving in zoos. We learn a lot from our history, but this has been a remarkable institution as I think back to the early days. The facility itself has a lot of buildings that were built around the turn of the last century. That really created the basis for us being one of the first urban zoos in the United States. The idea that you could have a picture of your great-grandfather standing in front of the same building that you're in front of today is just phenomenal to me. I started here in 1949 as a part-time veterinarian and took over as director in 1962. And I was able to work here till 1992. Way back, I never thought of myself as a pioneer, but in zoo medicine, I was, I guess, one of the early pioneers because at that time, there were only two or three full-time zoo veterinarians around the country. Veterinary medicine came a long way from the days when I had the literal black pack. I had my stethoscope and thermometers and a bandage, and that's what I brought to Lincoln Park Zoo. Chicago. Dr. Lester Fisher, our veterinarian, I'd like to have you meet him right now. Mighty... Lincoln Park Zoo is a very special place in a lot of people's minds because of the old zoo parade and Marlon Perkins, who was the director before Dr. Fisher in the 1950s until 1962, he brought a zoo into everybody's living rooms. And when I would walk through the grounds with Dr. Fisher when I first came in the late 70s, People would come up to Les and ask him for his autograph. It was that special. He was a part of people's lives. And every day out here, we have thousands and thousands of people along this zoo main street and every place else in the park, too. That was a different time, too. That was when animals were really here more to entertain, more than they were now, which is more conserving and teaching people about the plight of animals in the wild. The zoo became, when I became director, a, a challenge to me personally. I realized that something had to change. We had to do something that would work better for the animals. It wasn't until really the Zoo Society formed in the 19, late 1950s, and then the board of directors started raising money for the Zoo Society in the 1970s, that the zoo really changed from being this oldest zoo in the United States to being one of the newest zoos in the United States. And we started a campaign to get money for this great ape house. We built the building and then we put together a team of specialists, both veterinary and medical. And as we put different animals under the anesthetic, we ran a physical, which we'd never done before. And we actually did a film on Otto Zoo Gorilla, which shows that part of the story. And it became an award-winning film. The move was important. We established normal baselines for all these great apes. And it was very meaningful to see these animals now in a family group in a good space instead of crammed into a small place. So with that foundation of new facilities, that gave us the chance then to look at, okay, what are we doing with this facility? We're not only creating these great exhibits for the animals, but we have to do more. We have to tell the public why we have these animals under our care and what we can do to help them in the wild. So that formed the basis of our education programs and our conservation science programs. 
which in the last 30 years, that's been the biggest development at Lincoln Park Zoo. Once we get into the 1960s and 70s, we start to see a transition towards less of a kind of passive, here's what a giraffe looks like and observe it, to more formal programming, more complicated signage, interpreters, volunteers, talking about the animals, classes that more directly and actively tried to connect people to nature. We were still part of the park district at that time, but the park district was primarily a recreational facility. So the Zoo Society provided the resources for us to hire educators, to hire conservationists. Les Fisher was a real visionary at the time when he created a conservation and science program here at the zoo. That was a very unusual thing to do. I hired the first scientist here, and at that time, that was a breakthrough. I came to Lincoln Park Zoo in summer of 1989, and I was the only research staff person. We focused on meaningful, small research projects for the curatorial staff. They would come to us with questions. For example, how can we get the polar bears to spend more time in the water? Or why are the penguins being so aggressive? When I first started, there was a couple people in our education department who worked for the park district and Steve Thompson had just started as our sole conservation science person. We looked to conservation science to help us with questions that we ask. The Davies Center for Endocrinology and Epidemiology, when that started, and Dr. Rachel Santermeyer started here, it opened up a whole new world for us as far as being able to look at reproductive hormones, stress hormone levels with our animals here. Those kinds of tools are things that we really just dreamed about when we first started because we really just went off of anecdotal information about how we thought the animals were doing based on their behavior. The hormone information especially gives us a look at their inner life a little bit and how they're responding to their environment or things that happen in their environment that we may not be able to pick up on. I think when people think about zoos, they might still think about the old model of zoos, where you came to a zoo, you maybe touched an animal, you interacted with it physically in some way, and then you would leave. And zoos have really evolved past that. When I started the zoo in 1976, we were still doing chimp tea parties at our children's zoo. It was extremely popular. We dressed the chimps up in clothing and they sat at a table and had something to drink. And at the time, it was acceptable. But as we learned more and more about chimp behavior, in order to get the message across that they are endangered and people need to protect them, we can't treat them like they're humans. We can't dress them up like they're humans. There's a disconnect there. Keo, I think, is one of the most well-known chimpanzees ever to live at Lincoln Park Zoo. He went through a lot of change through his life. In the 60s and 70s, he was involved in activities that we would never engage in today. Later in his life, he had that opportunity to really find his true chimpanzee self again. When we think about what Keo has seen, through that long 55 years living here at Lincoln Park Zoo, it's encouraging because he's a symbol of really the progress we've made in how we consider chimpanzees as a species and how we care for them as individuals. I remember in the mid 90s, we were already doing kind of paper and pencil behavioral observation projects, um, which have now graduated into, for animal care, being able to use Zoo Monitor. And Zoo Monitor is an app that we developed here at Lincoln Park Zoo to be able to collect data about how animals are behaving, where they're spending their time, and really meant to be this behavioral monitoring tool that you can use as a manager to make a decision. The zoo monitor is really important. Just the idea of being able to get real-time data and then being able to make some husbandry changes. One of our zoo monitor projects in the birdhouse is looking at our black neck stilts and their behaviors during breeding season. So it's a mixed species exhibit. We start to see territorial disputes during breeding season. So we've used Zoo Monitor to help us plan and foresee when that might happen. And we're able to make habitat changes so all the birds are able to live comfortably together. Before Zoo Monitor, I think we're kind of guessing or kind of trying to figure it out along the way. From an animal care perspective, we're focusing on behavioral goals as opposed to natural history of the animal in order to figure out what should they be doing, how much time should they be spending doing certain activities during the day, and how do we achieve that in the spaces that we have for the zoo through enrichment. 
Through our opera conditioning programs, our enrichment programs, and our zoo monitor program, one of the things that we're trying to do is integrate all of these things together into a holistic management approach. Welfare is not about the physical health alone of an animal. It's about the behavior of the animal. It's about how it feels in relation to its habitat. Our exhibitry went from being one of an exhibit with a lot of animals to exhibits that were pretty bare but had a lot of space for breeding to exhibits that actually show the natural habitat of the animal. That started to get people away from just looking at an animal and being entertained by it by understanding that the animal is part of a habitat and these habitats are disappearing and we need to do something about that. We've been renovating buildings ever since I started here in 1990, and we continue to do that in order to make the best spaces for animals, or we're adding human spaces for our learning programs. When you think of old zoos, you think of the menagerie, and you think of the person who wanted to collect as many things as they could collect, and then showcase that. It's really different now. Gone are the days where we have birds in tons of cages all over the place. So we're really looking at these ecosystems in our habitats the seashore exhibit, if you go and look at it, you could take a picture of a beach along Lake Michigan and see the same animals and see the, the plants and see the sand and see the water and it feels like that's a real habitat. I think my most memorable experience in coming to the zoo was when I got my first visit for uh, the Regenstein African Journey which was, I think, really the, tr the, the first transformational exhibit, so different than anything that had been on zoo property before this. And it blew me away. Both the human experience and the animal experience was so much more like what, what someone would experience and the animal would experience in their natural habitat. One of the zoo's most iconic buildings is the Culver Lion House and a landmark here in Chicago. That building typifies sort of the history of zoos from about the time that it was built. That was the state of the art in 1912. Now our goal is to design habitats that really connects our visitors with nature and with the animals. At the same time, we have to balance the animals' needs, the animals' welfare. We have to give the animals choice at our new Regenstein macaque forest or our new Walter family Arctic Tundra or the new Robert and Myrie Pritzker Penguin Cove, visitors are outside in a covered area looking at animals that are outside. The visitors are experiencing the same weather, they're experiencing the same sound, they can get up close through glass. One of my early jobs as zoo director was we had lost a very famous Mike the polar bear and we held a, a small service up there, a memorial, and we tell stories about Mike and about what he meant to the community. And I still remember one youngster came up to me and, and he said, you know, I really miss Mike and Mike knew me. And I said, well, how did Mike know you? He said, well, I put my hand up on the window and Mike would come over and he would put his paw and push off there. And we had a bond, and it was a very special bond just between the two of us. Well, obviously, I didn't tell him that Mike did that with a lot of people, right? But I'm sure that child, to this day, still cares about polar bears and probably global warming and all of those factors. And that started from an early childhood experience. And those kind of emotions are what spurs people to be thinking about conservation and the need to take care of these animals going forward. Fisher Center began in 2004 as the main scientific center here at the Regenstein Center for African Apes. We became interested and involved in the study of welfare and psychological well-being, and this allowed us to advocate on a scientific basis for helping the welfare status of animals that didn't even live at Lincoln Park Zoo. We founded Project Chimp Care as a way to advocate and study animals who really had difficult housing situations, living as pets or entertainers or in unaccredited zoos. And through this science, we were able to advocate for changes in policy and, and legislation. A few years ago, chimpanzees were called split-listed. It meant that chimpanzees in captive facilities were not endangered, but chimpanzees in the wild were. 
But working with the Humane Society of the United States, as well as the Jane Goodall Institute, we work together to change that legislation so chimpanzees are no longer split listed. This was an important move because it's a fully endangered species that are no longer able to be bought and sold on the open market. So we were effectively able to end the pet trade for chimpanzees. Our local field work and our local conservation work really started to ramp up heavily when we created the Urban Wildlife Institute, which is our newest center. It was really formed to try and figure out how do wildlife use cities? How do people use cities? Where do they come into conflict? and how can we make sure that we can preserve and protect wildlife within urban environments. The Urban Wildlife Institute sort of evolved into the Urban Wildlife Information Network. And it's just that now there's incredible force in many cities across the United States where we're learning more about how to better reduce the conflicts between humans and animals in these urban areas and enrich the lives of both. I think it's always surprising to people when they don't really realize that the zoo has scientists. And then when I sort of explain to them, no, we have 35 to 40 people at any given time, scientists here on staff who are working across five different research centers. We're one of the largest conservation and science departments in the country. And we publish some of the most of any of the zoo-based science programs. When I tell them that, I get a lot of excited interest in hearing more stories, either about their favorite zoo animal or about the type of work we're doing in a place like the Republic of Congo. A modern zoo today is about conservation, is about education, about helping the communities. It's, it's helping to conserve species. This, that's a, that wasn't done in the early days. It's a really unique scientific experience because we work so closely with animal care to try and apply science-based methods to how we take care of the animals every day. And there's an instantaneous opportunity for getting that science out to the public, out to school kids, when we collaborate with the learning department on their programs. These individual animals are really able to tell stories about their wild counterparts. If you don't have a zoo, how do you tell those stories? And how do you better understand what these animals' needs are? And for some species, they only exist in zoos. There are species that are extinct in the wild, and zoos and aquariums provide um, an opportunity to be an assurance population. So species that are extinct, like the Guam rail or the Guam kingfisher that are functionally extinct in the wild, zoos have a population where we could be prepared if there is a time when reintroduction would be appropriate, where we can then reintroduce those species into the wild. When we accomplish something good, it's okay, what can we do next? Our community engagement in Little Village has been wonderful. What are we going to do next? Our conservation programs in Gulogo are great. What are we going to do next? We will continue to look at new opportunities for us to use the science-based approach we have at Lincoln Park Zoo to make the animals' lives better where they live and to also enrich the communities that are in Chicago. There's never been a more critical time for us for conserving species in the wild. And zoos are really the champions that are not only telling those stories, but actually funding and having staff that goes out and actually performs a lot of the conservation work that's happening in the world.